This is Rick Collins with Abington News. Joining us today is Peter Schaefer, the superintendent of the Abington Public Schools. We figured we're now about uh, full week number three, so we thought we'd check in and see how things are going. Um, but first, the big question I think everybody is kind of wondering about is the status of uh, the school system and COVID-19. We've had, I think, three confirmed cases within the community. And I was wondering if there's any update that you can provide. Sure. Um, so there have been three within the, the school community. Um, the uh, DPH updates the number of cases in Abington, and um, that update that update takes place every Wednesday. Uh, as it stands, there are there are thirteen in Abington as of last Wednesday. Probably that will go up as Abington sees uh, an increase in cases like other communities across Massachusetts, but there have been um, three in the Avenue Public Schools. Um, I believe everybody's doing, doing well. And um, it's uh, unfortunate. It's also uh, one of the underpinnings of our, uh, our safety protocols. So those, those people, you know, again, just hopefully that they stay well, but having them stay home obviously helps keep the school community and the broader community the safest. So going into the school year, I assume it was pretty unreasonable to expect or anticipate that there'd be zero cases throughout the year. Um, how did that planning go in terms of, this is what we expect, this is what the acceptable range is, and this is when we have to start saying, okay, we may need to pause things. So I'd, I'd be lying if I told you I knew what to expect um, with any certainties. Yes, did expect that we would have cases and um, anticipate that we will have more cases. I, I know this, the more people just follow the rules and wear masks and you know wash their hands frequently, uh, maintain social distancing, um, stay home when they're ill, the better for everyone, the better for the community, the better for businesses, the better for everyone's health. Um, you know, I, I, we're no different than any other place in the world. When you get large gatherings of people that are, I'll turn my anger down, sorry about that guys. You get large groups of people sharing germs, they're gonna get each other sick. Um, and so I just, I wanna ask people to please help us all out and um, follow those rules that we all know, I won't repeat them, um, because that's the way to keep things the most open and the most safe. Are you concerned that we're seeing this already just a couple of weeks in? Uh, should parents be concerned? I mean, I, I did anticipate we would see people that would identify as positive. Um, there's always, a level of concern, but that's what keeps you diligent about safety. And so I'm not, I do not think that um, we are inordinately risking the population. I do not think that we're making the wrong moves by being open. We're following all of the guidance that we can follow. And I, and I mean, I, I listen to the same television stations and radio channels that everybody else does. There's so much information out there from so many different sources and so many different opinions. The best that we can do is follow what the DPH and the CDC give us um, to keep people as safe as possible. And that's what we're doing. What type of guidance have you received from the state or from other resources when it comes to determining, okay, we may need to take a pause, take a step back, reset, uh, go to full remote, has there been any guidance handed down or is that just, again, left up to schools to decide? There are these uh, metrics to help you make the decision. And I, I make all of these decisions in consultation with our Board of Health and Marty Golightly. Um, he and Lindsay, the public health nurse, have been just outstanding. 
And so there is a metrics that there is a metric that provides that um, four number of cases per hundred thousand means this, eight and so on means that. And the more cases you get, you move from an unshaded category, which is the lowest, to green, to yellow, to red. It's important to know not only where we are with those numbers, um, but to know why we have those numbers. Is, is it um, something that's being uh, spread in schools? Is it something that was spread in a business or in a gathering in town? Um, and so it's not just the metric, it's, it's also a high level of detail about mm -hmm. what's going on on the ground uh, and the, that collaboration with um, the director of health is key. So there could be a situation where you have seven or eight classrooms maybe being quarantined at one time, but it doesn't necessitate a full step back to remote. Maybe it's, it's uh, you know what the cause is or, or something, but is there a contingency where you have a significant portion of the student body out, including staff? There's, so the contingency is if you get, a, if you get an outbreak, you, you, know, you go remote. And what that magic number is, I don't know. Okay. Um, what that proportion is and where that is, it would again depend on the circumstances on the ground. Um, each each one of those is just examined individually on its own, uh, depending on uh, the trends. Are we seeing good cooperation so far in the schools, both among students, teachers, aides, and following the rules and protocols? <sighs> I, you know, in the beginning of the summer, when we talked about kids wearing masks, I, I just, masks, I just scratched my head and I had no idea how we were going to pull this off. I am so proud of our Abington students. Um, are they perfect? They are not perfect, but nobody is. And um, having said that, they've been amazing and they have risen to the occasion and they are consistently wearing masks and they're doing everything that they've been asked to do in their compliant. Um, not 100%. There are kids that we're going to have to remind, um, but it's not the Wild West. They are, they are thoughtful. They're, they're wearing masks. Um, our faculty and staff have, um, now we're in, as you said, in, into work, into week three, um, adjusting to this, this new situation, and, and we will continue to adjust. People are working harder than they've ever worked before, and it can be a little frustrating because um, as a teacher, uh, you know, you get your bang for your buck when you've got a class of kids in front of you that are just soaking up and loving what you're doing. And with our numbers and our learning models, you're just not gonna get that same bang. Um, we all know the best way to educate kids is when they're all in front of us. We're just not able to do that right now. So talking about the first week or, or the start of the school year, um, we're into, I think you said, full week number three. I mean, basically, how has it gone? Has it gone to plan to expectation? Is there any lesson that uh, you've taken away from those first couple of weeks that maybe need to be adjusted? There are constant, we're constantly making adjustments. Um, and whether it's the um, materials and how they're published in the resources, um, professional development to help people improve. Um, you know, the, the, the teachers came back and they spent those, those 10 days before school uh, beginning to prepare for 170 days of instruction. Um, just the safety protocols alone took you know, days out of that time. Mm -hmm. um, the curricular connections, the, the technology, the um, getting devices um, out into people and retooled for the software. Um, I know, you know, we had, the, we had the full summer to plan overview of one of these three options, but the people putting it into play um, had to hit the ground running pretty quickly, and they did. And, and they're getting into their stride now. Has there been something that surprised you at how either well it's gone or how rough it's been? Um, it's, we, we really tried 
to get Abington teachers to run the secondary virtual academy. And I really thought that that was going to be something that was going to work for us. And it didn't work. Uh, it, it was an extra amount of work that um, people uh, weren't able to do at the beginning, again, because of these new challenges. So we outsourced it. Um, I wish that we had it in-house. Our elementary virtual school is our teachers, but our secondary isn't because we just didn't have the staff to cover all the different sections. I was surprised that we weren't able to implement that, um, but um, the, that was the situation and we outsourced it. And the students are now working with a company called Tekka. Um, we continue to collaborate with them to get that uh, running more smoothly. Um, it's had its bumps in the road. Um, other things, um, I, I was surprised at how well the students acclimated themselves uh, to this new normal. Um, I just, every, every time a couple of days go by, I just, I want us to be in school as long as possible and, and more. And obviously, you know, I don't want the phone to ring for someone to be ill because I don't want people to be ill, but I also, I don't want people to be ill because I want us to be in session. It's, um, it's healthy and um, the more time that we get with the kids, the better off uh, people will be. So there are a few surrounding towns who are essentially, who are, who are doing kind of the hybrid model, but they're also simulcasting basically the teachers in the classroom at the same time for the students who are, are at home. Why didn't Abington uh, choose to go that route? So one of the difficulties early on was just the devices in order to pull that off. Um, those communities were able to acquire those devices. They were hard to get, I, I don't know if people are aware, but and you can, you can, it doesn't take much to imagine there's a shortage of devices right now. Uh, the world started buying up computers once everybody went remote and they're still buying them up. We have, we have computers still coming, um, some on order. The other difficulty was just the quality, the quality of the instruction. If you've got a teacher with both the video and the audio at the front of a room with a group of students in front of them, the amount that the students are getting at home, um, I'd, I'd wanna, I don't, I don't wanna be critical of other districts or other, what other experiences people might be having, but I'd wanna see the quality of that experience sitting at home for the day um, spending an hour in algebra and then, you know, an hour later, the, um, the English class comes on and yet you have trouble really hearing and seeing. And because it also compromises the ability of the teacher to manipulate things in the room for the kids that are present. They're, they're basically stuck in a spot. Um, and, uh, so, uh, that and, um, it's a subject to collective bargaining and what can be agreed upon um, with associations. So those are really the, the three reasons that it's not to say it's not working in the other communities. It's not to say that it wouldn't work here, but those were some of the difficulties with it. Should parents be concerned that their students will fall behind students from the other districts who are using that model? No, I no. We're all falling behind from where kids were uh, pre-COVID, and we will all catch up after COVID, and we will all keep up as best we can during COVID, um, and then catch up. So they'll, they'll be they'll need to be an adjustment. And on one hand, if you've got a younger student, it can be more stressful because you feel like they're missing. Um, those early building blocks and elements. At the same time, that student has longer to recoup these losses that they're experiencing during COVID compared to students that are older students who are able to learn more independently. Um, you may feel more stressed on that end because you've got someone who's going off to college and you want them to be competitive and ready to go. Um, they're both different situations. Younger students will catch up. Um, they're not falling behind their peers um, the entire peer group is behind where other groups were. 
in previous years. Okay, so it's not like you know a fifth grader in Abington is just going to start learning pre-algebra, and someone in another town is going to be full into algebra. It's it's not that sort of off balance. No, and and um, to be to be quite honest with you, coming from Abington with the amount of technology that we have with the new building, we're in we're in better shape than most places. I know that people comparison shop on social media. Um, those aren't always the best places to draw your conclusions. So for the students who are on uh, using Tekka, for example, or even just uh, the um, primary school students, they're, are they in class five days a week or are they in four as? Tekka? Yeah. Five. Five. So is there concern that, uh, or is their curriculum lined up with Abington's curriculum in terms of uh, what's being taught in what day or what month, what week? Or is there an issue where those students might be starting to pull ahead of the, the hybrid students, the kids who are going half time? We're tracking all the standards and all the strands that are being delivered. Mm -hmm. And at the end of their, at the end of the year, they would have covered the same things. There will be differences in terms of pacing um, between the two groups, but the, but go through a full year and the topics will be the same. Okay. So just as a superintendent who's had to deal with things he's never had to deal with before, have there been moments since you've been back at school when you've gotten into superintendent things and you're like, oh, this, this feels much more comfortable. Uh, it, it's nice to be back to school and having to deal with, you know, the little things that you normally don't have to, or that you usually have to deal with. Everything is different. Everything you touch. Um, nothing's been you know, business as usual that I can think that I can think of. Um, other than other than my parking spot, I mean, I feel like everything else has changed on us. I'm sure everybody else feels the same way. We're fine and we're doing well, um, but you know, we're working through a, a pandemic, and um, it's certainly got its challenges. Any final thoughts for parents or anything they should be keeping in mind as we move through this year? If you could continue to, um, as best you can, um, work through, uh, we, we had to build a one size fits all system for people that both parents are working, one's working so that there's asynchronous and synchronous and, and kids are in two days and people are doing what they can. Um, relieve yourself of the guilt and the stress of things you can't and you are not able to do. Do the best that you can with them. We will continue and we're here and we will catch up. And um, your, your son or daughter is not falling behind their peers. They're all in the same place. It's not to say they're the same place that they were years ago without COVID. Um, but we will continue to work through it and catch up. And, and just I want to praise our families for sending us such good kids who... Um, who have adjusted as best they can to this. Um, keep, keep sending those kids because they are good kids and uh, appreciate um, their, I mean, they, they're the ones that make it all, all that work over the summer. Just having it work, you know, for a month, two months, three months um, is, I mean, it's appreciated. Uh, because you can see that that some good is happening from it and we just want to keep it going. So as much as people could continue to wear those masks and keep people home if they're ill um, and, and work with us around that, um, it'll keep us all the safest and um, open the most. Abington School Superintendent Peter Schaefer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.